Okay. Good afternoon, everyone. Hi, Barry. Hi, Johan. Good to see you again. Yeah, likewise. All good? Yeah, I'm enjoying these regular Sunday sessions. Yeah, <laughs> since we've got so much time these days. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> hello, Michelle. Hello, Annie. Hello. Hi. Okay, we've just got everyone signing in. Hello, everyone. Hi, Brian. Hello, Alison. Alfonso is back. Happy to have you with us again. To Emma's, welcome. Remember to let us know where you're from in the chat section. Okay, Graham is signing in. Hope everybody's bubbles are well chilled for today. Hello, Paul. I see one of our members again joining. Gary, Julie. Joe, Joe, I hope your bubbles are well chilled as well. Okay. Uh, Sean, Reed says, Sean Reed says they're really thirsty, so we won't take too long before we crack that first bottle. Good to see Lydia back. Lydia, I hope we get to see some of those photos you've been sharing again this week. Hello, Graham. I hope you've got all your wine delivered. People are still coming in, so let's give it a, a minute or what. Michelle and Annie seems to be having fire going that side. Curious to know what you've got in store for us. Don't yeah. tell us now, though. Yeah, <laughs> hang in there. Keep that a secret. <laughs> Sean is back. I think it was Sean that was having the Buddha Horse Bry last week, if I was not mistaken. Tony, welcome. Ted, Ted has been a regular one. Nice to yeah, see think, you all joining. Some regulars. I think we had a lot of new, new viewers this week, so that's great. A lot of regulars and a lot of new people joining us, which is fantastic. So welcome to you all. That's great. These are, we're going to give another 30 seconds or so, so everybody's tablets and laptops and phones are plugged in and everyone can sit back with a nice glass of bubbles. Always a good time to have bubbles. So. Barry, are we celebrating the end of the week or the beginning of a new week or how does it I work? think we should celebrate the beginning of a new week. Okay, we'll do that. <laughs> okay, one or two more coming in. Hi, Tian. Uh, hello from Barcelona, Catalonia. Fantastic. All right. Hi. Terry, back, Horsham, Rodney, Barton on the water, Paul is in, Julie, Laura from Horsham, Achman, we're drying a kilo of Buravos again. <laughs> Fantastic. <laughs> All right, we're going to get going soon. Jane and Emily, welcome back from, I thought I pronounced that correctly. Let's see where the rest are. Horsham, some more Horsham. So I guess on planes. delivered your wine, I think, uh, Friday. Should be set up for today. Wimbledon, okay. Great stuff. Wimbledon, sparkling strawberries and cream. We'll have to work on that. Um, Orling. Okay, fantastic. Thanks for sharing where you guys are from. Keep them coming. A special welcome to our friend from Barcelona. Okay, I hope we could get all well, your wines is on its way, Alfonso. And if you asked about it, if not, I'm sure it will reach soon. Um, okay, so I think let's get going. Um, 
Welcome everyone to lockdown session number three. Um, it's been fun so far. Um, we're in week five of, well, lockdown in, in South Africa. So I think it's just fitting that we have um, some sparkling wine this week to get everybody's spirits up and uh, everybody cheerful and bubbly. And I was also thinking, Barry, I mean, has been on top of my mind for the last week or two, maybe more sparkling wine, uh, not so much Benguela Cove, but our vineyards on, on your side. So for those that are joining us for the first time, Barry is our managing director at Manning's Eve Golf Club and, and Wine Estate, which is a sister vineyard of Benguela Cove in South Africa, in Hermanas. So, Barry is our, our managing director, but he's also our viticulturist. So he's our, our wine guy that side, looking after the, the vineyards. And then also joining is um, Michelle, our assistant winemaker. Michelle, you're on camera as we speak, so you can give a little bit of a wave. And uh, next to her is our executive chef, Annie Bardenost. And uh, we'll get to you guys a little bit later because I'm really curious to see what you are busy with this week. But Barry, yeah, I was, as I was saying, um, it's been, I'm sure, maybe more on top of your mind than mine at most, well, especially at night, early mornings, because this is a, a crucial time for our vineyards, right? Um, for our vineyards, our sparkling wine, um, vines, that side. Absolutely, and thanks for the intro. Yeah, I must say, you know, always a very stressful time through April and May, um, while potential for frost is, is quite big. Um, our biggest challenge, as everyone knows, in the UK is frost. So far, touch wood, we've had a fantastic start to the season with one of the war warmest Aprils in, I think, the last 50 years. Um, just when things started to look a little bit dry, we had some lovely rain. So I, I couldn't ask for a better start to the season, to be honest. We've had, we had a bit of early frost, but um, we delayed pruning and a couple, had a few tactics up our sleeves. Um, to delay budding, which we did very successfully, and we managed to miss those early frosts. So, here on Manning Seas, things look fantastic, to be honest. That's here. Yeah, that's so. Uh, it's looking like um, crop-wise. I know it's early, but it's one of the the bigger hurdles are out of the way. Is it safe to say now, or is there still possibilities of frost going forward the next week or two? Yeah, and we've actually made a decision to delay bud rubbing just with another week. Um, I don't want to be too optimistic. As we all know, uh, the UK weather changes on a ticky. So um, I, I think another week or two. I and mean, then last year, I think the 6th of May, we had quite a bad frost, actually. So middle of May is when we can really all take a deep breath and relax regarding the frost. And again, such wood. <laughs> I don't want to jinx it. But, um, you know, it'll be our first, first crop, so we're super excited. Um, it'll be a small crop, but uh, looking good. A little bunch is already sitting on the vines. Ken, I see you joining us from the, the patio in front of the, the clubhouse. And uh, it's funny that you chose to sit there because um, I was thinking I was, I was supposed to be there right now. And I've got so many good memories of all the tastings that we've been doing with the wine club members and uh, followed by barbecues and dinners on that exact um, patio. Unfortunately, we're doing it in a little bit of a different format this time around. But um, talking of, of tastings and what we've been doing there before, maybe, I mean, since you're at Manning's Eve at the clubhouse, um, do you mind sharing some of the stuff that we usually have on offer there? Absolutely. Thanks, Johan. Um, yeah, I'm sitting with, with the beautiful waterfall, waterfall golf course behind me. Um, every time I see this view, I'm, I'm so pleased to have made the move across to the UK. Absolutely beautiful property, this. Um, I just thought I'd share a little bit of background on our vineyards on Manning's Heath. Uh, bear with me. All right, so it all started, um, these are a couple of our vineyard blocks, which we thought as this was part of our Kingfisher golf course, um, we made a decision a few years ago that as golf is, is, is ever changing, um, that it would be a good thing to reduce 
the two 18-hole golf courses to one signature course, 18-hole, and one nine-hole nine course on the Kingfisher. Um, it just so happened that that piece of property was also ideal, ideal to plant vines. Um, and so we've named the blocks after the old golf holes. So if we look carefully here, we've got a Chardonnay block called Old Fields. Uh, we have a little block of Pinot Noir called Scraggled Oak. Um, we of course have called a beautiful block of Chardonnay after the Kingfisher. And down at the bottom, we have Hawkins Court Corner, which is also one of the Chardonnay blocks. On Mannings, we have 37 acres planted and a four, further four acres planted on Leonard's Lee. Uh, the first vines went in in 2017. And we estimate at full production around 72,000 bottles of sparkling wine. Um, very exciting, 2020. As I said earlier, this is going to be our first vintage. So in the background, we're busy working on, on our new brand. And later on this year, alongside the first harvest, we plan to launch that brand and the name of the brand and, and what it's all going to look like. So it's quite an exciting year ahead, to be honest. Definitely. Here's a couple of pictures of where it all began. Um, I know, Johan, you were very involved in, in looking for the perfect piece of land um, and, and your belief in UK sparkling and West Sussex um, is what got us all here in the first place. Um, there's a lovely picture of yourself and our owner, Penny Streeter. On the right-hand side was the, um, our vineyard consultant, um, Duncan McNeil. Um, you can see the little little vines going in there in 2017. There's a lovely aerial shot uh, when the land had just been prepped just before planting. And I just wanted to stop on this slide and show you guys why the decision was made to plant vines here. Um, there's a couple of intricate things that we all need to make vines work in the UK. And one of them is south facing slopes. Obviously the warmer slopes, you want to find a bit of land which is very sheltered, so you haven't got issues with wind. Um, soil also plays a very vital role. Uh, we are on clay. A lot of the vineyards planted in the UK are on chalk, but we're looking for soil which is not too fertile, um, as over vigorous vines ultimately will lead to bad quality wines. So we've got lovely marginal soils, we're well sheltered and on a lovely southern slope. And the fourth and very important factor is we're below, below 100 meters above sea level. Um, so all those boxes were ticked when this piece of land was found. Surely one of the UK's most picturesque vineyards. Uh, I mean, there you've got some more photos, but it is so beautiful when you go out there, which people are obviously welcome to join you guys for the drive there, right? Absolutely, Jan. Um, I mean, you and I both absolute 100% belief in this property. It really is a jewel in the crown of Sussex. Um, just a couple of pictures of, of the vineyards last year. So this was to, towards the end of the season. Uh, you can see how those little vines have grown up. Um, and you cannot believe how beautiful they're looking at the moment. In beautiful, even bud break. Um, and there will be some amazing pictures coming out in a couple of weeks. So that was just a little, a little intro, Johan, just for everyone to see what we're up to here. Um, we obviously don't just grow vines here. We also, it's very important that we support Benguela Cove and we market the brand throughout the UK. So we do a lot of wine tastings, as you mentioned earlier, out here on the terrace. We do cheese and chocolate pairings. We do fantastic buggy tours where we all get into golf buggies and we head off to the vineyard. Um, let me just see if I can share a, share a few pictures with you guys. It was just a question, Barry, while you're putting um, that up, is uh, how different is our vineyard at Manning's Heath in comparison to um, Benguela Cove? And um, I mean, if you can, you can fill me in here, but it's um, as far as, um, how can I put this? As far as the, the philosophy goes around winemaking in that um, both properties are cool climate, there's similarities in that both are cool climate, but also both um, Mannings or vineyards in the UK in general and Benguela Cove 
vineyards are both are planted in in marginal grape growing conditions so it's not those safe parts of the world where wines are being made for many many years it's it's marginal as far as grape growing goes and both properties also share this and the reason why i mention it is that the great wines across the world have got one thing in common and that they are grown in in marginal areas you know when a vine stresses and the condition and nature is a little bit tougher what comes out on the other side is wines with, with character and real uh, personality. So as far as that goes, there's similarities between the properties, but as, as Barry now just mentioned, it's, um, it is completely a different set of rules that apply to growing a vine in the Northern Hemisphere or in England in comparison to the Southern Hemisphere. Here we're looking for cooler slopes. The wind is our friend because it cools down um, the vines, um, the opposite applies to, to England, where you're looking for warmer slopes, uh, you're looking for a sheltered vineyard so you don't have wind, so the heat um, stays within the, in the vineyard. Um, often altitude, guys seek altitude if they don't have proximity to the ocean to get to cooler sites. Uh, England, the lower you can go, the better, again, for, for frost and, and various reasons. So. Uh, as far as grape going goes, uh, very different, but as far as the philosophy and the belief in winemaking goes, um, yes, definitely similar. Sorry to interrupt you, but just wanted no, to cover that while we're in the vineyard. Not at all, Johan, 100% agree. I mean, it's all about the site, isn't it? You know, um, and I know many years were taken to find the, this fantastic site, which effectively you did find here in West Sussex as was the case with Benguela Cove. Um, you, it's impossible, although you're a fantastic winemaker, if your grapes aren't great, you're never going to make good wine. <laughs> okay, and now I think it's time for us to, as we all know, sparkling wine's not the best wine to pair with food. So I'm super interested to hear what uh, Annie has got for us in store for us today. Annie, could you let us know what you've decided to pair? Yeah. Good afternoon, everyone. So today we thought we'd do something a little bit different than your normal seafood and sparkling wine pairing. So we're going to be baking a cake. Um, it's a passion fruit and pineapple cake that we're going to be baking over our open flames over here. So to be a little bit different, as you say, and try something new. So desserts and not a, a appetizer. Yes, no, we're going <laughs> desserts full on. Um, so first of all, you have to make sure you've got a nice fire going well ahead of time as you need quite a bit of heat to bake your cake in your pot. So to start off with, we have a nice big, thick uh, cast iron pot. And in here, we just made a caramel of sugar, uh, brown sugar, which has a little bit more flavor, uh, butter and a little bit of lemon juice. Uh, why, why lemon juice? What does that do? Uh, because we use brown sugar, it has a bit of a bigger granule than white sugar. So it just takes a while for it to melt. So that extra little bit of liquid just helps it melt a little bit faster. And then we just add some pineapple. Let's see, it's just normal chunks that we add in there. You can fan it around the pot if you want to. You can just do normal circles, but like the whole rustic look of it. So we just added a bunch of chunks in there. Okay, so if I don't have fresh pineapple, I can use canned pineapple. You can use canned pineapple as well. It won't make too much of a difference. You're using pineapple and passion fruit for the cake today, but let's say, I'm assuming it's for the pairing of the wine. If you want to do some other fruits and not maybe paired with something else, would I be able to do that? Yeah, you can use any fruit. It's a very versatile recipe. Okay. You can use anything that you like. So we're going to go on to the ingredients very quickly. So we're going to do a wet, all the wet ingredients first. So we have some buttermilk over here. So just going to add all that in there nicely. Uh, eggs. Some oil. A bit of vanilla and then we just have two or the pulp of two passion fruits that we just hollowed out so we just gonna add all of that in there and just mix it together yes a nice little whisk and give that a nice whisk okay <laughs> not so rough <laughs> Okay, so we're going to put this aside and then do our dry ingredients. Right. Michelle is just going to sift into right. our pot. Okay. Thing. 
So we got our white sugar. Why am I putting all the dry ingredients and not just adding it? As you can see, everything has like a little bit of lumps in it. So it's just to get all that lumps out. Otherwise, when you're baking it, you're going to have that lumps in it as well. And you don't want to be baking or biting into a cake and biting in like a flower pot hole or something. It's not very nice. <laughs> Mix it together. That nice. Okay. Sift, and then we're just going to be folding or mixing that into our wet. Okay, so dry to wet and not. Yes, it's just wet. easier because you have your wet mixture which you can just pour and then just quickly mix this. Is that too great? No, no, it's fine. Okay. And then again, make sure you mix it nice and thoroughly. So you don't want any, like lumps. I said, lumps. <laughs> Nobody likes a lumpy cake. Okay, and then lastly, we have some coconut that we're just going to be mixing in. Okay, and you're adding the coconut afterwards. Why? And not just with the rest of the dry ingredients. Uh, your coconut has quite a big flake to it, so when you're going to try and sift that through your sift, it's not going to go through you. <laughs> you're not going to have any coconuts in your face. <laughs> That makes sense. <laughs> okay. So after that, can you make sure you have all your lumps up? We're just going to be using our nice little ladle and just slowly and carefully pour that over. And why would you slowly pour it over and not just kind of chuck everything in there? Seems um, well, when you just chuck it in there, you've placed your pineapples all neatly all around your pot. So as soon as you chuck it all in there, you're going to move all that fruit around and you're not going to have that nice fruit or caramel layer in the bottom so it's just not going to be the same keep the layering in right exactly okay okay so this so um we're going to be needing so you can use anything you just need a bit of elevation for your cake to get the coals and stuff underneath it so i'm just using it's a bit of wet wood that we're going to put in the bottom and then we just take some coals and move that, arrange that nicely underneath it. Annie, there's a question. Yeah? There's a question on, um, can you do this on a gas barbecue as well, or the oven? Um, gas barbecue is not going to work so nicely because you're going to see, now when we're done, we're going to put some of the coals on top of the pot as well on the lid. So it creates that heat, so it gets heat from both sides. With the gas, you're only going to get heat from the bottom. It's going to be safer just to put it in the oven. So it's going to take exactly the same amount of time in the oven as you do on the fire. So it's going to take about 30 minutes. It's just a little bit too lively. Let's try and swap these out for some other ones. Okay, the oven on the So if you put it in the oven, the temperature in the oven, you're going to need about 180 degrees. Or 30 minutes, exactly the same amount of time that you're going to put it on the fire. So, put our lid on. And when you're using something, make sure you've got your heat. So you don't cover a lot of the base of the pot. So you're going to need quite a bit of heat on the bottom of the pot as well. And then we're just going to put these on top. And you have an oven. <laughs> yeah, we got an oven. We're doing more bright things today. Okay, so that's it. And it's going to be in there for about half an hour. Can you open the lid to check, maybe, if you're used to high? Um, it's, gonna be a bit of, it's gonna be a bit of a mission if you try and get all the coals off and then try and get to your cake. So you're gonna have to work on trust. <laughs> <laughs> I've baked it a couple of times, 30 minutes is more than enough time for it. Okay. Good, so good well, luck, Annie, that, that looks really impressive. As does that view in the background, I must say. <laughs> it looks like it when it comes out as well. <laughs> so yeah, so while that's on the fire, we're gonna go over to Johan and he's gonna tell you a little bit more about the wine. Thank you, Annie. I think um, Michelle knows all about going on, on trust because it's a bit like when you put your wines into the bottle for, for the second fermentation when we do sparkling wine. You can't open it every now and then to check if it's fermenting. You just have to, you just have to hang in there and hope that it, it happens. So uh, let's, let's hope the cake makes it to the other side. <laughs> um, okay, we've been talking a lot um, and I don't have... I've got an empty glass, which is a problem. So let's start tasting um, here. I've just, with my wine eye, spotted a question, which I'll answer while I'm busy going is, can anyone go to Manning's for a, a tour and a wine tasting? We just discussed the vineyard tour. Anybody's welcome. It's not a 
a members only or wine club only um, club. It's it's open to public, so anybody can go to the restaurant, go for wine tastings, the vineyard tours. It's open to public. Barry, I'm right. Yes. Absolutely. Yeah, we welcome all here at Manning's. Um, and what I didn't get a chance just to mention is uh, one of the favorite tours, of course, is we take the golf buggies and we take you off for a little drive through self self drive to the vines. Um, and we crack open a bottle of sparkling wine, give you a glass or two and tell you a little bit about our history. And we come back to the clubhouse and we have a fantastic tutored tasting. So highly recommended for those of you that haven't done that. Um, and along with that, we also do cheese pairings, cheese and wine pairings, chocolate pairings. And then we have the ultimate Mannings, which uh, involves a little bit of golf and a lovely dinner at our beautiful restaurant. So with the ultimate golf, you get to do wine tasting and golf. Yeah, we, we, we just play one. We take you on, for those that have never played golf, you go out with one of our golf pros and play one hole of golf. And then come back and, and, as I said, then enjoy the rest of the wine experience for us. So would it be fair to say then that that's probably the only place in the UK where you're allowed to drink and drive? Absolutely, Johan. We, we don't advertise that too much. <laughs> <laughs> okay, let's get to the, to the wine. Um, and quickly just on opening it, because I've, um, I've seen various ways of opening sparkling wine. So um, forgive me if, if, if you know this already, but um, once you've removed the foil, always keep your thumb on top of the cork because sometimes, just sometimes it tends to go by itself. So keep it a firm hold on it while you're releasing this little wire. And while you're doing that, you can impress your friends by saying that uh, all quality sparkling wines uh, have six turns. If you make six turns for it to come off, then it's a, a quality or a good sparkling, but obviously not true. All of them are six, but you can keep that info for yourself. So keep a firm hand on the top. Um, keep uh, your hand around the cork. Keep your top hand, my left hand, still while you're just turning the bottle, the bottom of the bottle. So your top one is still and I'm just turning the bottom and you'll feel the cork is coming by itself. As the cork is coming, gently push it, try and push it back into the bottle just to keep the pressure inside. And once it comes out, you don't want a big pop because with the big pop, even though we love, it's probably one of the best sounds in the world, but you lose a lot of gas um, from your sparkling. So what you want is, and the French uh, call it a whisper. So it's just like a, a very soft, like, that's kind of what you, what you want. You don't want to shoot the cork uh, or point it at anyone. Um, Cause as I said, you, you lose pressure, but more important than that, there's also the risk of losing some of your product, which would be, which would, uh, be, would be terrible. So as you pour, always pour down the side of the glass. So what I do is I usually pour me a little bit like this and just give the, the glass uh, a good rinse. Um, the reason being is that uh, when you use a, a tablecloth or a drying cloth, those little pieces of fluff that stays behind inside the glass, all of those little pieces of fluff, no matter how small it all, is it causes the, the bubbles to become gassy and it almost ignites the, the bubble. So then you lose all of, of your bubble and you'll see it, you'll see all these active bubbles going around in your glass. The reason being is that it, it's got some fluff on the inside. So that's why I always give it a, a rinse. Um, the other thing or the other reason for rinsing it is, is that um, dishwashing soap is the biggest enemy of sparkling wines as well. So if you pour yourself a glass of bubbles and all of a sudden within four or five minutes or even sooner than that, it's gone flat, it's because there was some residue from uh, dishwashing soap in it. So always remember to give it a, a bit of a, of a rinse. 
and also to preserve those bubbles, just pour it down the, the side of the glass. Because if you pour it from the top like a beer, it foams and you, you lose a lot of your, of your bubble. So, you'll see there very few bubbles going around because I gave it a good rinse so the glass is clean. There will always be a little bit coming from the bottom. Some glasses even have deliberately, they make for the sparkling wine glasses, a little scratch at the bottom, which causes the bubbles to right in the center of your glass to go up, which kind of looks um, pretty, I, I guess. Um, I'm just going to take a little sip here before, because I want to explain to you also the process of, of sparkling wine and let's, like we've done with the previous wines, talk a little bit about the style from around the world as well. So I'm just going to put up my screen for a second. So we're having the Jour de Vie today, which is our premium um, we call it Cap Classique, and I'll go into that um, in detail a little bit later. But in essence, it means it's a bottle fermented um, sparkling wine. And if I forget, remind me that I also um, explained to you the various ways of making sparkling wine. So this is a bottle fermented one, and you'll see on the label we clearly put bottle fermented as well. So, um, Jour de Vif, if you don't know, it means the joy of living, happiness, cheerfulness, celebrating everything that's good in, in life. So from there, the name, we can't call our sparkling wines like anyone else in the world. We can't call it champagne. So we've been a little bit cheeky and given it a, a French name. But um, from there, the name, which everything good in life or celebrating or fun often goes alongside lovely. So, as I said, um, don't point the cork or shoot the cork um, out. You're, gonna, you're at risk of losing product. The only person that's allowed to do it is this guy. But if you're not Hamilton Russell, don't, uh, uh, Hamilton, um, Lewis Hamilton, uh, don't, don't do it. So what a shame to be wasting a bottle like this. But anyway, uh, that's besides the point. Therefore, I was um, so happy because um, every time I see these Formula One guys um, spraying out the champagne, a, a little bit of my heart breaks. So I was quite delighted recently, um, and this is an image of the South African rugby team that was re recently crowned the world champions uh, last year. And I was so delighted with not only how the guys won the final, Barry, can you remember who they played? Uh, it's besides the point. We're talking sparkling today. <laughs> Stay focused, but John. Stay focused. <laughs> the reason why I'm putting this up is that um, I'm so was so delighted to see how they've used beer to spray and to celebrate at the end. So absolutely, I hope this is the way forward. Where in sports or in celebrating, if you want to spray out a bottle, rather use beer than bubbly. Um, but anyway, that's just sidetracking a little bit. Let's get to, to the sparkling wine and the history of it. So this guy on, on the left of your picture is, uh, is a French monk by the name Dom Perignon. Obviously, he's got a, a very famous French sparkling wine named after him as well. So these guys back in the 16th century were making wines in the Champagne region. Um, when they made these wines, uh, by the, it, they didn't have the yeast, commercial yeast strains that we have today. So those yeasts weren't all that active, um, you know, to finish a ferment, al alcoholic fermentation in, in good time. So uh, towards the end of the fermentation, autumn kicked in, temperatures in the cellars started dropping. So with the cooler temperature, the yeast's ability to do the, and to finish the fermentation also goes down. So when they, what looked to them like the fermentation stopped because there was no activity and no turbulence going anymore, they thought the fermentation is done. Obviously back then they didn't have the, the labs and the technology we have today to, to confirm to us that the fermentation is done. So what they've done is they've 
took that wine and they bottled it and it was perfectly safe during winter because it was nice and cool and the still wines were sitting in the bottle. But as spring and summer came along and the cellars started heating up again, those yeast cells that were still in the, in the bottles became active again. So they didn't die off completely. Some of them still um, survived, but with the rising temperature, the activity goes up and they took whatever sugar was left in that wine and started fermenting again, a, a secondary fermentation. And that caused part, one of the byproducts of a fermentation is CO2 gas. So as that secondary fermentation started, it popped the corks out of the bottle. So what they did back then is, um, almost like we have today, and I'll show you an image a little bit later, they put a little a bracket or a cap on top of the cork to keep it inside the bottle. So this worked, it kept, um, this bracket kept the corks inside the bottle, but this fermentation was still going on. But because that gas can't escape, because it couldn't push out the cork anymore, that gas or the bubble dissolved into the wine. And it was um, on the 4th of August in 1693 that um, Dom opened the bottle and was just so amazed by what they found and how it tasted this product now with the, with the bubbles inside. And there's a very famous quote uh, when he discovered this, which you've probably seen before is, but his first words was calling the others and saying, come quickly, I'm tasting the stars, referring to the bubbles in the wine. So being a product that's been around for, for centuries, many famous people have been talking about it over the years. Just some of them um, that, I've, that I've got is pleasure without champagne is purely artificial. Um, there's one there comes a time in every woman's life when the only thing that helps is a glass of champagne. Um, too much of anything is bad, but too much champagne is just right. Uh, I kind of like that one. Um, the famous uh, Lady Bollinger, I only drink champagne when I'm happy and when I'm sad. Uh, I'm sorry, I'm struggling to read this because there's a sign up here. Why? Why do I drink champagne for breakfast? Doesn't everyone? Um, and they go on, you can have a read of them. Um, Winston Churchill, he was a big lover of um, French champagnes. And he even went to war on trying to defend um, the champagne region. Um, and it, while I was looking this up, it was, it was quite a, 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 a astonishing number, but it, uh, the rumor goes, well, according to, to Google, the research, uh, during his lifetime, he enjoyed 42,000 bottles of French champagne. So, oh. um, <laughs> what a lucky guy. <laughs> Absolutely. Okay, champagne is simply one of the elegant extras of life. Uh, you can see Napoleon was also um, a big lover of champagne. And then my favorite um, one of them all is Burgundy makes you think of silly things. Bordeaux makes you talk about them and Champagne makes you do them. So I'm sure everybody's got some good stories around um, sparkling wine. So Champagne, we talk a lot about Champagne um, for the reason being they were the first ones doing it. They um, the, the method, the, what we call method champonas, was what Dom Perignon discovered. But uh, ever since this has been made, obviously, across the world, um, and nobody else other than Champagne, because Champagne, as you know, is an actual region in France. So if you're not in this region, you can't refer to your sparkling wine as a um, Champagne, obviously. So a lot of other countries do it outside of, of Champagne in France. They make some beautiful ones in other regions, but it's called Cremant. Uh, Italy, it, Italy makes some in this method, which is called Metodo Classico. Uh, the US calls it the traditional method. Uh, Alfonso, you'll know in Spain, they call it Cava. In South Africa, 
we call it cup classic or method cup classic. So you'll see on your bottle, it might say, or often it, we just refer to it as MCC. Um, and that means method cup classic. Based what it is, it is exactly the same method as the French method champenoise. It's just been made in, in South Africa, Portugal, Spumante, other parts of the world, some call it SEC. You'll see um, Italy, and you might ask, but why not? Um, why is it not called Prosecco? The reason being is that um, Prosecco is, is not the, using the, the French method champenoise. Prosecco is a whole different way of, of, um, of, my, of making sparkling wine. So um, everybody's got kind of their own name or what it's known for coming from different countries. And as we know, maybe not yet in terms of volume, but in terms of um, quality, there's um, one of the up and coming countries, or not up and coming already there, is the sparkling wines coming out of England. And um, Barry, I know it's been a topic of discussion for a while is what are we gonna call our English sparkling wines? And um, is there any, what's the latest on that? If you, uh, is there any news on it or is it still in, in discussion? Johan, you are absolutely a very hot um, topic at the moment. Um, I think if you and I had our way, we would call it, just call it, purely call it Sussex. Our total belief in the area that we've actually got wines planted in. Um, but at the moment, yeah, we're still sticking with sparkling wine for now. But uh, watch the press. I'm sure in the next year or two, that will change. Okay. I thought I'd just share a little bit of stats on the UK wine market, um, show you how we've grown over the last couple of years. Sure. Um, All this interesting. Yeah. So. All right. So we already have 658 commercial vineyards um, and 164 wineries um, with a total hectareage of over three and a half thousand. I think what's interesting here to note is that that three and a half thousand um, over the last um, the last few years have almost doubled. So we've grown since 2015 by 83 um, percent, substantial. Um, 2018, we did a total wine production of 13 million bottles, but with the current vine in the ground, we are set to be doing 40 million million bottles by 2040. Um, so that's a substantial growth. No surprise, the top varieties that have been planted uh, are all the sparkling wine varieties, uh, with Pinot Noir and Chardonnay almost both sharing first plates with around 30% each. Um, third, uh, uh, Pinot Meunier, um, and then a still white wine, Bacchus, is in the fourth position. So wine styles, uh, we're sitting with 70% of, of the wines that we make in the UK, sparkling wine, no surprise there, and 31% still wines. Um, very interesting, the market. Currently, we're only exporting 8% of all UK wines made. Um, so, and then 53% sold through the trade, 32% through seller door, and online sales are sitting at around 6% a figure which I'm sure will change dramatically in the next uh, couple of months with on online sales absolutely booming. This is a graph which I find really interesting. So a vine needs an average temperature of 14 degrees through the growth season. Um, this is showing the climate over the growing season over the last 100 years. So if we look at the little red dots, uh, we can see over the last 15 years, idyllic conditions to grow vines. And that's why we've had such a boom, boom over the last few years and why so many French vineyards are coming across the water and buying property. Yes, yeah, I mean, just... it's, uh, it is, the UK is the biggest consumer of French champagne. So I think the French are quite nervous about what's happening in England now and how fast the vines are going in and what the potential production is going to be. So uh, yeah, I, I guess it comes at no surprise that they're now starting to 
buy land and I know four big champagne houses that's been buying up land in, in um, south of England and Sussex specifically. So um, yeah, it's interesting. And what better endorsement for the English wine industry than the French coming to buy land there? So uh, yeah, exciting, exciting times. Absolutely, well, and I mean, I, you, you're aware of those few blind tastings that have happened over the last few years, where where we've had English sparkling wine submitted in amongst the top French champagne houses, and uh, the UK sparklings came out top. Yeah, I know the Blanc de Blanc sec, both the Blanc de Blanc and the Rosé, the English sparklings beat the French and this was a blind tasting. And for the Brut section, it was a, a tied first place between a French and an English. And that really opened up the world's eyes to uh, the quality of uh, what's coming out of England, which is, which is fantastic. Barry, I haven't seen you with, with a glass, um, which worries me. Uh, well, Johanna, and I was going to ask you when I could open my bottle because it's really rather dry on this side. <laughs> because if I remember correctly, you were giving yourself out for a sabrage last week. Um, I hope you didn't forget about that. I didn't forget, but it's something that I might regret. <laughs> but anyway, <laughs> I'm up for the challenge. <laughs> so, should we, should we get this started and get a bit of bubbles in my glass? Um, you have your I, kit. I've got all my kit, got my trusty saber. Uh, just a little bit of those that want to try this at home. Just a little bit of background. So Sabraj, we think, originated from Napoleon, who was uh, again a big favorite of Champagne. And it was, it's rumored that uh, on winning or losing battles, he would always open a great bottle of French Champagne. And being on horseback with a saber in one hand, it would be very difficult to, to open the cork. So you used to just chop off the top of the champagne and, and that's where Sabraj originated. So a little bit of the key thing here when we want a Sabraj is to make sure we remove the foil completely. Okay. I've actually put this sparkling wine into an ice bucket upside down for a couple of hours. That just improves the, the way the cork will break. Um, we are then going to, I think I'm going to have to stand up for this one. We then look for the seam in the bottle. This is actually a bottle of Cuvée. Johan will tell us a little bit about this a little bit later. It's very important to find that seam. All right, are we all ready? This could go very badly or it could go really well. You then take one, two, and on the third strike, make sure you carry straight through on the seam of the bottle. Right, Johan, you can count me in. One, one. two, three. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Replay. One, two. Oh, and there we go. <laughs> Ready? Yes. Just take off that little wire. Yes, I'm going to just take off my hood, hood on this one. So. so there you go. Live, it does not always work. <laughs> we will try <laughs> and we will succeed. That's the way it goes. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> not meant to be so messy, but we have, it, we have succeeded. And I can now finally <laughs> pour myself a glass of sparkling with a lot of bubbles. Um, the best is when you, when you do that um, is to, I don't know, maybe you've mentioned it, but is to keep the wine as cold as possible because then you obviously save a lot of the, the wine by doing it. You don't want to lose half your bottle. So that, anyway, guys, that's not hard to do it. <laughs> I think we had a few takes, but uh, we got the bottle open and you'll see there's a nice little angle to pour. Uh, just be careful of your hands and we have wine in the glass okay so let's now that everybody's got wine there was a question on can i um, rinse my glass with water instead of wine i don't want to waste any of the wine definitely i usually when i rinse it with, with the wine i just swallow that little bit um, i i prefer not to use water depending on where you are water can have a little bit of a, of a uh, like a 
chemical chlorine smell, which is, is not great, but so the best is always to rinse with, with a little bit of, of wine itself. <laughs> Another comment that Craig is saying, um, he's laughing about the, the rugby, he's asking, can we talk about cricket? Um, this is not a, a sports show, Craig. We can take that offline. We're talking about uh, sparkling, so that was uh, nothing meant by putting up that. I purely wanted to communicate a bit about the beer the guys are celebrating with rather than sparkling. As I mentioned, the Jour de Vif is what you've got in your pack, the last one for, for this month, and we'll tell you about the next ones in a, in a bit. As I previously said, um, Bottle fermented ones we refer to as cup classic. So it's this little shooting star. You'll see it on the on the bottle itself and on top of, of the wire it, it's also got the cup classic um, logo or the or the shooting star with table mountain uh, in the in the background. So this wine um, is a 2014 vintage that we're tasting. So, and you'll see on the back label, we've got um, all the detailed information about it. So this, uh, obviously the grapes were picked in 2014, bottled in 2014. Um, when, and we'll go into a little bit about the, the process of, of the secondary fermentation and how bottle fermented sparkling works in a bit. But um, the wine was fermented first time around, what we call the primary fermentation. We take that wine, which is then still a still wine, no gas or anything in it. We add sugar to that um, and we add yeast to that. So we add just enough sugar to it to get to the, the pressure that we have in the bottle. And just to, to give you an idea, we calculate the sugar to get to about uh, between six and seven bars of of pressure in, in the bottle. So that's about three times the pressure in a car's tire. So again, not something you want to point at someone when you open it or drop uh, a bottle. 2014 vintage bottle, then the secondary fermentation got going. And then you'll see at the back, it says disgorgement date. So that is the, that was when we removed um, that dead yeast cells from the bottle again, and at which time we put the cork on. I'll, t I'll show you a few images in a, in a bit. So um, what I'm trying to say is this was um, fermented and matured in this very same bottle that you poured it out this afternoon. Um, and it was matured in this bottle for four years. Um, the lease was removed. We placed the cork back on and was matured another year under cork and then um, goes into into market. So quite a, a lengthy process, but for the style um, that we're looking to produce with, with this one, um, it's a function of time and there's no shortcuts. Um, you can't fast track um, the process and what happens with time. So just like they uh, they use in Champagne ourselves. We also use the exact same grape varietals. So re remember, same process, even the same grape varietals. So this one is a blend of 57% Chardonnay. So Chardonnay gives nice longevity. I put up some of the flavors that you can typically get from Chardonnay. Chardonnay is it's more lighter, it's more delicate. It's got more citrusy flavors. And then we've got 43% Pinot um, Noir. The bottom of Pinot Noir gives that nice apple berry, cherry, more like a fruity type um, flavor to it. So this wine, for me, it's quite on the nose. I get a lot of like biscuity notes, like a red apple and grapefruit and quite nutty. You know? um, it's like it's starting to show a little bit of, of nutty flavor. So it's got a bit of both. It's got that grapefruit coming from the Chardonnay. It's got a little bit of red apple. The biscuitiness, the nuttiness is a function of time. So what I've got up here is this is the flavors that you get from a young sparkling wine from, from Chardonnay, from Pinot Meunier, from Pinot Noir. And this is the three main um, grape varietals used in, in sparkling wine. So while it's young, two or three years after vintage, this is the type of aromatics you can expect. 
four to five years in, those flavors become more like toasty, toffee, um, jammy, honeycomb type flavors. We know um, Noir moves more into nutty dried fruit and eight to seven, eight years down the track, it becomes more brioche and toasted bread and mushroomy and spicy almost. So this one is moving into that more nutty, biscuity um, side of, of thing on the, on the nose, but let's try it as well. So I think the first thing that you'll notice about um, this wine is how extremely fine and delicate um, the bubbles is on, on this wine. And it's something we take great pride in is how, how fine and elegant we can get the bubbles because that's really what um, quality sparkling wine is measured by is how fine and persistent those bubbles are. We call the, the, the liveliness or the how delicate the bubbles is there's a collective word for that which is called the mousse of the wine so the mousse refers to the bubble the sensation that you get the foaming that you get in your mouth that is what we call um, the mousse which is very important um, in sparkling wine so on the palate fine delicate bubble but you've got that that signs of that toasty um, like butter on toast brioche notes um, starting to show on the on the palate which is exactly what we want and those flavors as i explained don't come by itself that comes with the aging process and remember that those that dead yeast cells i spoke to you about they stay in the bottom of the bottle for the duration of the aging and after two years more or less they start what a process that we call autolysis so that start disintegrating and they start giving all these toasty nutty flavors back into the wine so depending on your style you would want some of those flavors or if you don't want that and you remove that yeast cells before that you're obviously more in this more fruit young fresher style of of sparkling wine so it all depends on what you want to achieve with your wine and what characters um, you're looking for um, but in general what we, the style we're looking to make here is a, is a clean, fresh style. I think it's got some nice um, citrusy notes. We, um, with our cooler climate and the region we're in, you get that nice, that almost I call it an oyster shell minerality um, to it. Um, and that's all that we're not looking for a big, bold, show off style of bubble. It's all about the elegance, the finesse, that very fine bubble. Or, or mousse, that is, uh, is what we're, we're looking for. Okay, so you'll, you'll pick up an old bottle fermented sparkling wines that that bubble, and sorry that I keep on going about the bubble, but it is so important. It's much more finer and smaller, where if you try um, the Chamat method, which a uh, best example would be your Prosecco's, or your normal sparkling wines, it's much more like soda. It's very gassy, it's a bigger, aggressive uh, bubble that foams immediately the moment you put it onto, onto your palate, where the bottle fermented ones are much more, more finer. And what I'm looking for, and this is almost best explained like a, like a, a ballet dancer, you know, you want the, in the wine, you want the focus and the tightness, the fresh acidity and what we call the structural or the muscle, but it, it's almost like a, a ballet dancer in that it just tiptoes across your, your palate with those little bubbles. So you're looking for structure and power, but in the same way, you're also looking for that lightness and, and elegance. And that's the, the beauty of, of sparklings. Okay, so different. Um, this is a little bit of a difficult one. I don't know why it was made so complex and so misleading, but it is what it is. Sparkling wines have different sugar levels um, and it's, it's very confusing, um, but it's uh, between zero and three grams per liter sugar in the wine. You're sitting with what they call a brute zero. I'm not gonna go on too long about this extra brut, um, still very dry, brut, and then this is the confusing one, extra dry, 
is actually what is in white white terms off dry or semi sweet. Um, and then you go on and you get uh, sec and uh, demi sec, which is much uh, much sweeter. So the one we're tasting today is in in this section, the bone dry extra brute um, section. So brutes are also sometimes uh, when we use a blend of grapes, let's say in this case Chardonnay and Pinot Noir, we refer to them as brutes. Um, then you also get Brut Rosé, which is pink in color. And then when it's only using white grapes like Chardonnay would be the best example, those are referred to as Blanc de Blancs. Okay, so I hope that helps you a little bit um, on it. So being in the in the cellar and in the bottle for for quite a, a while you know it's quite an expensive process um, but it's a sp specific style that we're that we're after um, we also make a, a second bubbly because you know you don't if you're like me you want to have a you want to have bubblies not only on special occasions or over weekends you know i if i want to open a bottle of Probably on a Tuesday night, I want to do so without having to break in the bank. So um, we also have a, a second bubble uh, called Cuvée 58, um, which is extremely um, popular. And it was, as I said, it was just having like an, a less serious, more towards that fruit driven side that I've, I've showed you a different style of, of bubbly. And maybe because we don't need to cellar it for that long, having it at a slightly more um, affordable price point. Uh, Barry, what is the, the price on the on these two? Yeah, and this is one of our best sellers. I think 20% of all the wines we sell in the UK is the Cuvée 58, and we're selling that for £15. So really, really good value. Okay, so there you go. So uh, as I said, it is, this is your everyday occasion sparkling wine. Still using the the process of bottle fermenting, so it's no shortcuts at all. It's just the uh, aging is a little bit shorter, so it's a little bit more fruit driven, and which is very exciting about this one, and it's a, it's a one of a kind coming out of South Africa at least, is that it's made from Sauvignon Blanc, which just gives that extra freshness and citrusy uh, notes to it. So also one to definitely to to get from Barry. Um, John, again, can you just, just touch on, sorry to interrupt you there, just touch on the glasses for us. I see you've, you, you've got quite a different glass, so have I. Uh, again, in the picture shown with the cuvee, we've got a flute. What's the ideal yeah. glass to use with sparkling wine? Yes, yeah, that's, there's a lot of talk been going on about that. I'm going to, and I've said it before, that I'll, I'll go into wine glasses, and I haven't done it yet, but I will, in one of our sessions coming up, uh, do a little section on wine glasses and the importance thereof. Um, but to, to keep it short, the traditional fluid wine glass um, the, that has been used for centuries for sparkling wines um, is not ideal was not the best one to to enjoy or, or to judge a, a sparkling wine it has been used because people like to be seen with it and let's be honest it feels good and everybody knows when you're sitting with a fluid in your hand you're having a glass of of bubbly so it will always be there it will always be a part of sparkling but if you want to get the maximum enjoyment out of it and to really appreciate it um, fluid is probably, not probably, it is the worst glasses to use for sparkling. I prefer this one, and I don't know if you can see that well, it's, it's more of a tulip, what we call a tulip shape glass. So it's still got the nice stem, it still feels nice and it's really light, but you'll see that it, it's much bigger than a fluid and it's got a much bigger opening. So what happens with the fluid, because it's so um, slim, is that all the gas that comes up is very focused and all that CO2 gas that when you try to smell it, it was almost like the CO2 just um, almost fills up your nose and you don't get to smell any of the aromatics in the wine. So the, I like these because they still are a little bit feel like the old fluid, but the best ones actually to do it, and I think you've got some, and I think I've even seen Michelle with them, is your stock standard white wine glass that is if for maximum um, aromatics and sensation and taste 
the normal white wine glass for sparkling wine is the best and I use it all the time unless I've got these around which is also uh, a nice crossover if you like. So the Kuwait 58 as I said came from we wanted something that's accessible for everyday enjoyment. You see some people have over the years re regret, regret drink, not drinking enough um, sparkling. Uh, I wish I drank more champagne my only regret in life is that I didn't drink enough champagne. So don't be caught with, with the Cuvée 58. You've got, um, you've got one that you can have in the fridge all week around. And then on the weekends and the special occasions, obviously it calls for something special, which is the Jour de Rive. Okay. So that is the, the Cuvée 58. Um, Annie, Michelle, are you still with us, it seems like um, the cake is on its way out of the pot or has made it out of its way. Can we? It's already made its way out of the pot. It's nice and whole. <laughs> Didn't mess it up for a change. <laughs> More successful than my sobriety, Annie. <laughs> <laughs> Slightly. <laughs> <laughs> well, luckily something worked today. Um, so yeah, so this is our cake. We've taken it out. We let it rest for about 10 minutes. Why, why did we let it rest? Uh, you just need to let it rest, just let the cake settle before you turn it out because you don't want the cake to fall apart as you're turning it out and you don't want it to let it rest for too long otherwise the caramel that was in the bottom is just going to start setting and then you won't be able to flip it out. Okay. Yeah. So um, we took a, the, the safer option and we flipped it off camera for you guys. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, so the reason why we paired uh, this particular cake with the Jour de Vie. It's just that uh, the sweetness in that tropical fruit flavors just balances out that slight tang that you pick up in the Jour de Vie. So, yeah, it's just like I said, it's just the perfect balance between sweetness and tang. And then also that caramel that we did in the beginning um, and the caramelization of that pineapple just brings out that biscuitiness that you also pick up in the Jour de Vie. Okay, I'm okay. going to decorate it. Uh, yeah, you don't really need to decorate it, but if you have to, we got a couple of things lying around here. So we got some passion fruit that's cut up already. Now, see from the ingredients, it looks like everything that's inside, you're just putting on the outside now again. It just kind of ties everything together. Yes, basically. So we're just going to do a nice little passion fruit. drizzle of passion fruit around. One more half here over here. So just to add a little bit of freshness to it as well. And okay. then we do have some dried out. So again, it's keeping with that whole thing of the tropical fruit. We have some dried out pineapple chips that we're just going to be placing around. You know, the same flavors. We've got some dried out mango chips. That we're just going to be pushing in there. Mm -hmm. Pulling over. <clears throat> Yes, we do have some coconut flakes as well. And just kind of just sprinkle it over. There's no point, like I said, to do like the whole rustic feel of it. So, and again, at the same flavors, we have some pineapple sage, just to add a little bit of greenery. It's really nice and fresh, though. What else? And then just to okay. finish it off, a little bit of flowers. So add a little bit of extra color. So yeah, smells really young. And this, what is this we have here? And there we go. Beautiful. That looks amazing. Okay. I can just imagine those tart pineapple-y, that slightly acidic notes come and the slight char just working beautifully with this like slightly mature style of, of sparkling so yeah i think mm. while you guys finish up we're gonna try this pairing and see if it works of course it works <laughs> <laughs> okay well back to you guys while we try this enjoy hey thank you so um yeah i'm sure that it's pretty amazing and i can't wait to try it um if i um, something else that you can try with your second bottle of, of Jour de Brief that you've got is, um, and this is a little bit of a secret treat, and um, 
sparkling wine houses won't tell you this because it doesn't really live up to the esteem of, of the product and their brands and, and, and. But if you go and search it, is that pairing, are you ready for this, Annie? Are you list, I'm not sure if Annie's listening, but skinny French fries with a little bit of extra salt. I know, extra salt French fries, I know, I know. But try, <laughs> it must be skinny French fries with extra salt with sparkling wine. It is amazing. Um, as I said, no one talks about it, but go and research it a little bit and try it with your second bottle or with your bottle of Cuvée 58. I see there's a little bit of discussion going here on the side on the Cuvée 58. So at a later stage, we'll have to do something with that as well. Um, someone was asking about, I've got coupe glasses at home. Uh, can I use them? I love them. Um, I just like the nostal how nostalgic they are and uh, um, got so many memories with those glasses. But unfortunately, as much as I, I like them, they're not great for, for the product. Um, it's too big, the opening. So the aromas are all over the show and blown away. Um, but more than that is with that big surface, it just lose the bubbles so quickly in those glasses. So I like the way they look and, you know, they said quite nostalgic. Unfortunately, not great for sparkling wine, but hold on to them. You can always use them for, for cocktails or, or something else. But um, you want to be safe for white wine glasses. Someone was also asking, um, I'm trying to get to all the questions. What is the significance for the story with the I'm going to be really short and brief about this. You'll see the, the bottle is almost like a diamond shape to it. So the most famous cut for diamonds is obviously various cuts um, that's been done all around the world. But the cut with the most uh, shine and reflection and shimmer, the one that's most commonly done is what's called the, the round cut. And the round cut diamond has got 58 facets to it. So diamonds and cutting diamonds is quite a, a skillful process. It uh, requires quite a bit of craft and training. And I don't know if you're even aware, but those guys have, and girls have to uh, do up to four years of training before they are left to do it themselves. So it's just a play on the skill and the precision that goes into cutting a diamond, that same skill and precision goes into making sparkling wines. Because sparkling wine is the most detailed form of, of winemaking. It's so many detail uh, and precision that goes into making sparkling wine. So it's just a play on the cutting diamonds and sparkling wine um, and the relationship between them. and. Um, Diamonds is a girl's best friend. Um, Bubbles is a girl's best friend. So it goes, it goes on and on. So from there, the, the Cuvée 58, uh, referring to the 58 facets of the, the round cut um, diamond. You know, sparkling wine, as I said, quite a detailed process, but it's also it's a non-forgiving form of winemaking because if you've got the slightest bitterness or harshness or maybe just a little bit of an off aroma in the wine it, it's non-forgiving because you know with the bubbles it just elevates everything out of the glass so if there's anything whatsoever not perfect it will show because the bubbles is almost makes it like looking at the wine through a, a magnifying glass you know so if anything is at fault it will show in a sparkling wine so uh, it's um, it's either you get it right or or not I promise I'll briefly touch on um, on the, the making process. So there's three ways of, of making sparkling wine. So the one is taking a still wine, a normal table wine, and following like the soda method by just um, injecting it with CO2 gas. Those are easy to tell. The bubble is quite aggressive and big and foamy and they're just not pleasant. They don't have the same elegance and the, and the, the fine bubble and texture to them. Uh, and therefore, obviously, also at a, at a lower price point. Uh, the second 
method. I'm just going to cover the biggest three. There's a, there's a, there's another one, but um, the the second one is the Shamat method. So this is uh, mentioned before. This is the best known one for this is the Prosecco wines. So the fermentation in the Shamat method, the second fermentation, which um, is responsible for the the bubbles and the CO2, it doesn't happen in the bottle with the cap on that keeps the gas inside. This happens in a massive 20, 50,000 liter um, stainless steel tank that can um, withhold this kind of pressure, ferments in there, and depending on the winemaker, three months, six months later, it is moved from this tank into various lots of, of bottles. Okay, for bottle fermented sparkling wine, each and every single bottle is its own individual fermentation and the maturation also happens in these bottles and for much longer. For Cup Classic wines, the minimum aging time in bottle, to call it a Cup Classic, is 12 months. So there's lots more aging going on, but you've also got all these individual bottle fermentations. And with the bottle fermentation, you've got, with the lease at the bottom, you've got the, exp the ratio of lease to wine is much bigger than in a big vessel. So therefore the, the quality is also uh, quite different from bottle fermented to the Chamat, AKA Prosecco style. Um, another difference is that uh, the bottle fermented ones would be six to seven bars of, of pressure where your Prosecco styles would be three to four. So it's got lower pressure and bubble um, in it. And, uh, and the Shamat method also doesn't get that, that fine, delicate bubble like the bottle fermented. And someone mentioned, and thank you for that, is not to try the Sabrage with Prosecco at home, because the Prosecco obviously doesn't have the same level of, of gas or pressure inside the bottle to help you to get that uh, top off. Okay, I think I've pretty much covered the process now. So it's um, repressing the grapes. It's in our case using what they use in Champagne, Chardonnay, Pinot Noir, Pinot Meunier. Then you make up your blend depending on how long you want to age it. Chardonnay ages much better than something like Pinot Noir. So if you want to make a style like we've done with this, which is the intention is aging, more that nutty biscuity notes. You use a grape that ages better, so we'll have a higher percentage of Chardonnay. If you're looking for a younger style, something that goes to the market two or three years after the second fermentation, more a fruity, apple berry style, you'll use a higher percentage of Pinot uh, Noir, for instance. So Chardonnay ages longer, Pinot uh, Noir shorter, if you want to have something that's good in three or four years from vintage, then you start blending with the two. So you make up your blend, put it in bottle, you add your sugar, you add your yeast, and you lock it down in the bottle so that second fermentation can, can get going. And once the second fermentation is going, we put it away in the cellar and we forget about it for a couple of years until we feel happy with while the flavors have developed in the bottle over time then there's the process of now having to get that lease out of the bottle because we can't keep the the lease in the bottle because again that'll just make it that it foams out totally so um this is bubbles under the microscope um anybody want to take a guess in the chat section how many bubbles is in one bottle of bottle fermented sparkling wine. You guys can have a go there. Just remember that I do give you the answer eventually. Um, so back in the days, this is how Dom Perignon and his fellow monks did it. They had this little wire that just kept the, um, the cork back in. And until today, sparkling wine bottles still have this, this lip. So um, this is used by very few winemakers just as a talking point. What most people use these days when they bottle it um, for the second fermentation, we use a beer cap because that's actually a very good lock and it can withhold the, the pressure inside. So after the fermentation um, process is going, it's all it's 
lots of turbulence happening, but eventually as it finishes, those yeast cells die and they settle to the, the bottom of the bottle. So what you see there is dead yeast cells. And that is where the, the magic happens is once those yeast cells start giving flavor back into the wine. When we're happy with how it's developed, now it's the process of getting that out of the bottle. So it's a process that is called um, riddling. So it's a process which we, we turn the bottle just to collect all that yeast. But as we turn it, we also tip the bottle, so tilt it forward. So it eventually it slides into the, into the neck of the bottle. So you want everything to collect and as you collect it by turning the bottle, you also tilt it. So eventually you collect everything at the, in the neck of the bottle and the bottle stands upright. As you can see, this is the process. We start turning it. As we turn, we, we keep on, on tilting it. Back in the old days, or when you visit some wineries, you'll see this, um, is these A-frames. That was the monks just walked around tilting the bottles. It's quite a skill and it's actually amazing to watch them doing it. Um, nowadays, bigger operations, um, it's very common to use these automated ones where you just put in a couple thousand bottles in these cages and it mimics exactly what is done by, by hand, which is obviously much faster. Um, once you've collected everything, the bottle is upside down now. We put it into these um, glycol baths, which is um, at a temperature which makes the wine freeze. So we freeze the, the top tip of, of the bottle, which is in the glycol unit, it gets frozen with that yeast cells that are collected in there. Now, once that is done, we can turn it upside down. So this is what the second photo is. You can see that is a frozen section. So you freeze a little bit of wine, but also the dead yeast cells in the top. You can turn it upside down and it stays in the top. With the pressure in the bottle, once we remove that beer cap, the, the six bars of pressure just shoots out that frozen bit. And what you've got left at the bottom is all clear um, wine. So now, once you've removed the lease and the cap, you've got wine. Um, and this all happens in a matter of 30 seconds. Um, it goes onto a botting line where we inject. Um, everybody's got their own recipe, but you can add a little bit of, of sulfur to preserve it if you wish to. You can add a little bit of sugar to get the, the balance right. Some add a little bit of, of liqueur or like cognacs or brandies in there. Everybody's got their own way of doing it. With our one, if you wondered, we add a little small amount four grams of residual sugar. And it differs from year to year. It's just to get the, the acidity um, levels all balanced out. So that goes in the dosage liqueur, we call it. The second nozzle just brings it up to 750 mils of wine again, and on goes the cork and out she comes on, on the other side. Um, so there you have it, labeled, packed, ready to go. Brings a smile to everyone's faces as it should. Um, it's always a good partner at any party, perfect companion for sundowners. Um, and yeah, it's just fun all around, having bubbly at the, at the table. All right, um, I've got questions coming in thick and fast. Um, how are we doing for time, Barry? Um, I think we should start wrapping up, I think, Johan. I think um, we, we've got a couple minutes left, maybe just for a couple of questions. I've got one for uh, you. Um, yes. Does the teaspoon in the bottle save, ga save the gas in the bottle? That was from one of our viewers. <laughs> yeah, that's a good one. I, I still see that quite often, but um, the, the answer is no. I mean, these are, are the best, these um, sparkling wine stoppers. They're really affordable. You can get them from basically anywhere. And even in between, even if you are gonna finish the bottle, I, between serves, I like to put it back onto the bottle as well, just to keep the, the bubbles inside. Okay. Is there any other questions? I've answered the coup, the Cuvée 58. Um, 
what else do we why is england so sparkling wine focused is a question why not more still wines do you want to take that one barry well i think i think that's for, for me um we here because we know sparkling can be the best sparkling in the world um the it's still to be proven that we can make fantastic still wines in the uk um and i think as we develop and learn more about the right clones and the right varieties to plant and the right sites, we surely will make a great still wine. Um, but currently, I mean, it's, it's shown in the figures with 70% planted to sparkling. We know um, that is absolutely proven fact that we will be producing world-class sparkling wines here on, on Manning's and at Leonard's Lee. Yeah, absolutely. Um, another question is um, if it's the same grapes, the same process um, as what they do in Champagne, um, is it cheaper because it's of a lesser of a quality or how do we, how do we explain that? And I mean, I can just maybe give a, a short answer to that. Um, I've been working in, in France a couple of seasons and I, I'm, a, I'm a big fan of French champagnes and I travel there quite often so I get to taste it quite a bit so I'm fairly familiar with it and I can tell you without a doubt that the, the South African sparkling wines are right there up there in terms of, of quality. <coughs> um, I think if you take a couple of countries obviously England is one South Africa is right up there um, and then a country like Tasmania those countries can really hold their ground in terms of quality sparklings um, but remember with Champagne they've been doing it for what's it three four centuries now they were the first ones to do it they've got massive brands with big marketing budgets and they're all over the show and they're seen at all these fancy events so it is something that people want to aspire to and with that comes a bit of what I call a brand tax. So it's not necessarily paying for what you get inside and the quality, you're paying for the name and the brand as well. And that is with any product that is, that is the way it is. So, you know, if you take like for like, um, Barry, how much is the Jour de Vivre? We're selling that now for 20 pounds. So again, fantastic value. So if you take if you take like for like quality, what's inside, you're probably gonna pay 45, 50 pounds for a similar quality champagne. So given that it's now a time where we don't need to show off and to impress anybody by going to parties with champagne, because we're not allowed to, um, try something else um, at home. Try these um, MCCs from South Africa and try them blind. Compare them and you'll thank me later. I can guarantee you that. <laughs> okay, let's see if we can take one more question. Um, okay, the bubbles. Four million bubbles. Anybody uh, else take a guess? I've got Julie Smith with three million and Lindsay with five million. 5 million, there's another 1 million. So the answer is in one bottle, in this bottle you have opened tonight, there's 49 million bubbles in one bottle. Um, don't ask me who counted it, when they counted it. It must have been maybe with a previous pandemic, with a lockdown, someone had a lot of time, but it's a proven fact. In, uh, they've, they've proven it in labs. Uh, the count is 49 million bubbles in one bottle. So yeah, quite an amazing figure. Okay, so um, I think that is enough for, for this week. Obviously, you guys can keep asking questions offline um, later on. Uh, last week's competition was a was quite fun. Thanks for, for sharing um, some of those photos with us. Just want to see if I can uh, get some of them up here quickly. There was quite a few fun ones in there. For so those new that. viewers that have just joined us, we're running a competition for the best photo of you enjoying your bottle of today's sparkling wine and maybe with a bit of the food we suggest. And the best pick will win a case of the wine of the week. So yes, yeah, so last, 
Last week was Lydia Ace from Red Hill. I know Lydia was on this uh, on this call as well. Um, oh. So Lydia, you'll get your your rosé soon. Oh, sorry about that technology. Just some more images. There's you, Barry, going live on a pink PC. Some more images with Annie's uh, recipe. Thanks, guys. Fantastic. They keep them coming and keep them coming this week um, again. It's fun to, to see them and there will be uh, some wine up for grab again this time around six sparkling. So please go and share them on the social, on any of our social media platforms. Um, this is starting to become fun. We've got another three coming up in, in May, Barry, this month. Um, maybe it is hard, hard to believe we're halfway, huh? We, it's gone by so quickly. So, um, coming up, uh, Barry, what wines do we have in the May in the May box? All right, let me just bear with me. Let me share my screen with everyone. All right, so we still we still have our six week box available to those of you that that haven't taken part in the last three weeks. Uh, you are able to go on YouTube and uh, click on the links and follow our tasting sessions. So we have all six of the wines through the six week um, webinar. That will be the Lighthouse Syrah, the Joie de Vie, Lenisley Rosé from last week, um, our Semillon Sauvignon Blanc, a state wine, our Benguelaco Collage, which is the wine we'll be tasting next week. And we're finishing off the series with a lovely noble late harvest. Um, we've put together the May tasting back pack, which starts from next week. I'm sorry to those that thought it started today. Um, we just ran one week late, and that will be two bottles of each. So two bottles of collage for next week, two bottles of the Sem Sauvignon, and two bottles of the Noble Late Harvest. And that's selling for £95. So I just want to take a moment just to thank all of you for the fantastic support. We've had fantastic wine sales and, and our webinars have really been well attended. Um, so just thanks from my side. Okay, so yeah, and I, as promised, I will do a quick little, um, I'll cover wine glasses, stemware a little bit and the importance and I've been going on about it quite a bit. With the collage we might even chat about blending and why do we blend and how do you blend and then um, yeah the, the last one is going to be amazing it's a noble at portraitist uh, style of wine so um, by then maybe we can cover a little bit on um, on sweet wines and fortified wines and natural sweet wines and how this whole portraitist or noble at harvest thing comes about. Um, we're quite fortunate that we got some this year for the first time in, in five years. So um, yeah, it's uh, quite keen to share that with you. And I'll also maybe just share a few photos that we've been taking of this season um, as well. So um, yeah, I hope everybody enjoyed it. As Barry said, thanks for, for joining us. Sorry it, it went on a little bit long, but there's so much more to tell you and to share with you. So um, yeah, you'll have to come and, and visit when I'm over or Barry when on that side um, to get the whole story. What we've covered now is just on, on sparkling wine is just uh, the nutshell uh, or just scratching the surface. So I hope you've got some left in your bottle. Enjoy the second bottle. And uh, thank you, Annie. Thank you, Michelle, Barry. Good everyone. night. Thank you. Thanks, thanks to you, Johan, for a fantastic, informative session. Cheers thanks. to everyone. Bye-bye. Bye. 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 Bye.